chapter 2. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Barnes noted at this point how Paul evidently appeals to this, his persecution at Philippi, whenever he and Silas were placed in the stocks, and uh, then he uh, the great earthquake happened, the guard was going to kill himself, he winds up converting. That uh, Paul evidently appeals to this in order to show them that they were not impostors, and that they were not influenced by the hope of ease or of selfish gain, speaking of he and his company. He's saying, we're not impostors among you, we're genuine, we've suffered for this. Verse 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome, as the apostles of Christ. In essence, he's saying, we did not seek glory from you when we might have been burdensome, when we might have done so. Hence, the word is to be taken in the sense of honor, importance, when we might have claimed honor. He says, we come to you as servants. We didn't want any type of uh, people kneeling to us, bowing to us. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now it's very important to remember what Ellicott noted at this point. The call that we each have as Christians is not simply a momentary act, but a continual beckoning upwards until the privileges offered are actually attained. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you the belief. And this is actually a very fascinating statement because we today, as Christians, whenever we spread the gospel to others, we are teaching the very same message. This is not a message from men, as the atheists like to claim. Oh, well, I'm not going to let... A bunch of men tell me about the afterlife and heaven. No, this, this comes from God. Th this message is from God himself. Verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea, or in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen. And Thessalonica. Even as they have of the Jews. Now, why is Paul pointing out, out of all these other churches that have been established, why is Paul pointing out the one in Jerusalem? Once again, Ellicott, the churches of Judea are probably selected for example, not only as being the oldest and best organized churches, but the most afflicted, both by want and chiefly by persecution from the Jews. Remember, that is, that's where the Jews are, and the Jews were actually following Paul to um, shut down the gospel and to distort it. But I be I'm firm in this. I really do believe it's just a theory, but I believe it's pretty certain that the whole point behind all the other apostles staying within Jerusalem and teaching and preaching the gospel there and Paul being the only real apostle sent out to the whole rest of the world was because it would be the most difficult to preach the gospel of Christ in Jerusalem. They're both being persecuted by the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us 
and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And all the scholars picked up on this. These words are prophetical. But the announcement goes beyond prediction. The Jews, as a people, had decisively refused the gospel of Jesus Christ, and their fate was sealed. The nation was moving swiftly and visibly down the inclined path to ruin, an end of the old covenant and of national Israel as the elect people. In the year 70 of our Lord, 70 AD, Jerusalem fell after the most dreadful and calamitous siege known in history which was right at 40 years after Jesus. And we know that 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years of testing, 40 years possibly to see if they would come around to believing the gospel. But uh, after that 40 year time, boom, just as Jesus said, not one stone would be laid upon another. And man, was it ever such a horrifying siege. But uh, it was at that time that their altars were cut down the second temple was completely annihilated. They could no longer worship God there. They could no longer shed the blood of goats and rams and lambs that for their own atonement as they saw it. No more of that. All and ever since, there has been no temple built. And uh, the shedding of the blood for their sins, such as the scapegoat and all, all cut off because they rejected the ultimate sacrifice. Verse 17, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, how in the world did Satan hinder Paul? Well, there's a myriad of ways in which he has to hinder us. But I totally agree with John Gill on this. I believe that Satan had been persecuting him for a while, as well as his fellow laborers, by moving the mob which rose at Thessalonica to go to Berea and disturb the apostle there, which obliged him, contrary to his will, to go to Athens instead of returning to Thessalonica as he intended. And when at Athens, from whence also he might propose to return thither, he was hindered by the disputes the Jews and the Stoics and the Epicurean philosophers had with him. And after that, might be prevented by the lying in wait of the Jews for him, of which he might be informed, or by disturbances raised in the church or churches where he was by the false teachers which required his stay with them. Satan hindered him greatly. Verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. He says, I'm encouraged. We're encouraged because you are staying in the faith. This is showing us that, uh, that what we're doing is not in vain. That we're not just uh, um, exuding all of this energy and facing all of these death threats from all around every single corner for nothing. That God is blessing our ministry. Sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So verse 2 tells us about how Paul, he's sending Timothy to encourage the Thessalonians. Then we come to verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Verse 4, for verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Remember, these people had just been brought out of idolatry for many, many years, most of their lives. They, they had their belief and their reliance on these stones and these sticks and these statues, these trees, and uh, all of these other worldly elements that were not gods. And uh, suddenly, they except this completely new religion out of nowhere. So Paul, his concerns are justified. But now when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. 
And once again, Paul is reminding them about the great encouragement that he feels from their faith remaining. It revives us in our affliction to hear of your steadfastness, he means. It revives us to hear about this. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. He says we have thanked him infinitely for you. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So now we see a bit of a different change in subject matter. Paul, he's already told them about how much that he loves them, how encouraged that he and his company are by hearing about their faith and how that strengthens them and how thankful that they are to God for them. But now Paul, he's beginning to get into the meat of Thessalonians and to teach them about some of the things that they had been distorted in their uh, doctrines. What the deficiencies were is unknown. But they certainly include want of knowledge of the state of the dead and concerning the advent, that is, the second coming of Christ, the rapture, and these. Verse 11, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And it's with this very soft ending to chapter 3 that Paul is introducing the second coming of Christ as well as the rapture. 